takes a shotgun snap, quick throw, nice. caught by it Green! Is. It, it is, is a yeah. touchdown! Adriel Jeremiah Green! You don't live in Cleveland! Hello and welcome to episode 97 of Cincinnati, the Bengals UK podcast, and we are almost ready to go. It's under two weeks until the start of the regular season. We can hardly contain ourselves. Can we, Nathan? Because Nathan is joining me on the other end of the Skype line. How you doing, Nathan? You back in Blighty? I'm back in the UK, my son. Excited to talk to you and getting pretty damn excited about the start of the new season, which is now, I believe, what, about 13 days away from the Bengals taking on the Chargers. So a lot to talk about. Insane, isn't it, really, when you think about it? When, when you think about everything that's happened, the fact that we're under two weeks away from the start of a, of a season is insane to me. It really is. Well, I think normally you get that whole pre-season to sort of like whet your appetite before it, whereas this is very much just sort of, I know they're obviously doing the scrimmages and stuff like that, but this is very much full on just going to come out of nowhere. And I think we're all just going to be sat there in 13 days a bit like bloody hell, this is mad, isn't it? Like, <laughs> Well, I think you make a really good point. Uh, by this stage, we're sort of, we've been able to see what players are all about, Um what players look good, what players don't, how the offensive line is doing, for instance, but we haven't because there has been no preseason games and I don't know, that's that's a big miss, isn't it, both for the players and for the fans, really? Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? I mean, normally I, I, mean, I think everyone is uh, fairly critical of the preseason and not many people t- uh, particularly enjoy watching and it can be a bit drab at times, but now it's gone. All of a sudden, you got everyone saying, "Oh, I wish we had the preseason." You know, I'd love to see what the players are doing and how they're getting on. And so it's funny how that sort of has made a bit of a three sixty. But um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think it's going to be it's going to be very, very interesting. Come thirteen days, we'll obviously save our analysis of the Bengals versus the Chargers for next week's episode. But yeah, I'm really am. I've got to be honest. In the last couple of like the last week in particular, I think it's really started to hit home just how close it is, and I'm starting to get. Bloody excited about um, the first game of the season. You and me both, actually. Uh, and I listened, stayed up and listened to that live scrimmage for some reason at the uh, at Paul Brown Stadium with because uh, Dan Horde and Dave Lapham were providing commentary. That was a weird experience because it was little more than a. It was kind of halfway between a training session and a and uh, a full on practice game. So it was odd, but it was kind of nice to hear Dan and Lap uh, in full flow again. Uh, the crowd noise was very strange. It kind of sounded like I put on Twitter. It kind of sounded like listening to a rockabilly gig, but in the next room. It was all this, like this muffled kind of weirdness going on. Um, but anyway, I should say that uh, to talk more about that scrimmage and uh, more about everything, really, real deep dive into the roster and who's doing well, who isn't. Uh, we're going to be joined by the Athletics. Uh, Jay Morrison, our old friend Jay, is going to be back on the podcast in a little while and we it's actually quite a packed program we've got a a great installment of first and 10 a bit later on as well uh we've got some new actually let's get the news out of the way first um we have launched our very own youtube channel we've been talking about this for quite a long time but we finally got our asses into gear and launched one uh because we are planning uh, a few uh bits and pieces um this season and that means more video content um so that's something to look out for so do go online do go onto youtube search for bengals uk and hit that subscribe button as they say because as i say uh throughout the season we are going to be uh, uh upping our video content and that means not just uh us it means you being involved as well uh we want as many uh bengals uk listeners and Bengals fans in the UK to be involved we think we've got a nice way to do it uh, so do check our social feeds at who day underscore UK on Twitter and Bengals UK on Facebook and now of course YouTube Bengals UK on YouTube as well um, news of what we've got planned uh, will be forthcoming in the next couple of days so do stay tuned 
Um, You're basically transitioning from the voice of uh, Bengals UK to the face of Bengals UK, so aren't you? You've decided that the crowd wants more <laughs> of you, wants more of Bengals UK, Not and you're going to give it to them on video. Once they see my face on YouTube, they'll realise uh, it, it genuinely uh, <laughs> is a face for radio rather than video. But uh, still, you know, you've got to do these things. You've got to put yourself out there. And uh, I'm looking forward to, uh, cause as I say, it's not just me. Uh, lots of uh, other members of the group, if you want to call us members, will be involved. So you'll see Nathan, you'll see uh, Jamie Rowe, you'll see Kevin Angel, you'll see Matt Moon, you'll see all sorts. Sam Angers, uh, obviously our pin-up, uh, Bengals UK pin-up Sam Anger. Tom McDowell will be there. And we want to see lots more of you guys on our YouTube channel. And as I say... There will be news of how you can get involved in the next few days. So do stay tuned to our social channels. Now, a lot has happened, actually, in the past week. Um, not least, just slightly away from football, um, there's been more horrendous happenings in America which uh, caused uh, the Bengals to release another statement, but this time a really unified statement uh, of solidarity and... Uh, defiance and hope about the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, a few people have been chirping up saying, well, why in the Bengals haven't, you know, why have they not released the statement? Typical Bengals, you know. And as we know, the Bengals and Mike Brown in particular likes to kind of survey the land, see what's going on, you know, make some informed decisions about things. Uh and in the end, they did. And Carlos Dunlap came out and kind of said, and Trey Hopkins kind of said, look, you know, we want Mike to be involved in this discussion and this conversation. And then news suddenly uh, broke that they had had a meeting with Mike Brown. And uh, and then the very next day, they, uh, they did an extraordinary thing, I think. I mean, I don't know if you saw the statement that was issued by the uh, Titans in their locker room, which was an amazingly powerful statement. Uh, the Steelers did their own statement about what they felt about the, the need for change. Um, so, you know, NFL teams throughout the, the country have been doing this and issuing statements, as have, you know, the, the NBA has been uh, amazing in, in kind of their response to uh, the latest outrage in America. Um, but they they kind of did something very un bengals like but it was i thought it was really really cool they they marched together the team the players the the coaching staff the front office staff in fact all bengals employees by the looks of it uh walked the short distance to the freedom center in cincinnati uh the players issued a statement read uh uh, by both Trey Hopkins and Joe Burrow, which is an extraordinary in itself because Joe Burrow is a rookie and already he is, you know, taking centre stage, shows that the players really trust him uh, and value him and look up to him. Uh, and then in the background, there was Mike Brown in the middle of that little pack of enormous human beings uh, was Mike Brown. And... Uh, it was an extraordinary moment because Mike Brown gets a lot of stick and some of it is deserved, or some of it isn't at all. Um, but you have to remember the Brown family, um, especially his dad Paul, were instrumental in breaking down racial barriers in the late 60s and early 70s and way back before then in Cleveland as well. Uh, and of course we've had our very own Tommy Smith on uh, speaking about that in the past um for mike brown to actually join with the players it's something that was quite extraordinary to me and uh i i take my hat off to mike for doing that it was an incredible moment i think yeah 100 percent. and like you said mike brown does get a lot of criticism leveled at him and he's quite a private individual he doesn't do too many press conferences he does what one a year that he's famed for but i think to come out there stand alongside the players and deliver the message as a team in solidarity is a very strong thing, very meaningful thing. And like you said, a nice nice as well for Trey Hopkins to be sort of leading off there. He's, I think you've said before in the past, son, that he's one of those guys in the locker room that's very well-educated, well-respected. Um, and it's good to see him taking a leadership role. And obviously, 
Also, the fact that the team have, you know, said we want Joe Burrow to read this statement. He's happy to read it. You know, it's a strong, strong statement. That I think with someone with Burrow's sort of um, presence and his notoriety, um, it, it enables the statement to be sort of echoed further afield um, and more people to take a notice of it. So I think for the Bengals, it's a, you know, a really strong move and uh, a very positive move. Um Obviously, the next step is for these statements to bear action and change. So I'm interested to see um, how the Bengals will interact with the local community to bring about some sort of change. Seattle are doing something with voting. I know the Seahawks, uh, Pete Carroll came out and said something about, you know, he's ensuring that all his players get a chance to vote and and all the rest of it. Uh, The NBA, I think, have, have, have... mandated that every empty um, NBA stadium will be used as a voting hall, which I think is an incredible thing to do because, uh, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty in the States at the moment over postal votes and voting in person and all the rest of it. So if, that, that seems to be a really um, useful way to get things going in the community. So I'm, I'm very interested to see what the Bengals are going to do because let's not forget, you know, we've had incredible people like Gio. Well, we have incredible players like Carlos and Gio uh, who have incredible foundations. We have the Ken Anderson Foundation that does great work in the area. We had Andy Dalton's foundation that, does incre- that did incredible work in the Cincinnati area. And we also had, I think, the key one for me, and I'm not just saying it because he was my man crush, but the Michael Johnson Foundation, where he he got police to interact with the local community and break down barriers. I thought, I you know, that's the one to me that going forward that needs you know, is needed, basically. But what what I wanted to say about Mike Brown is this. Um, the the response to Mike Brown being in the middle of his players uh, from our followers, we put up a picture about that, and, and a huge response, a really positive response. A lot of people saying, you know what, I didn't really like Mike Brown before, but I tell you what, that's made me really proud to be a, a supporter of this team. I know they weren't doing it as a PR exercise, but I tell you what, Mike Brown has come out of this really, really well. And again, I know that they it's not the point of this at all, and I'm sure they weren't doing it for that. But it shows leadership, and it shows that every now and again, you've got to put yourself out there because the fans are itching to connect to this team. And just by doing little things like that was actually quite a big thing, to be honest. Let's face it, in the grand scheme of things. But doing things like that... Um, really helps to connect the team to the fans and vice versa. So I do applaud uh, Mike for that. And, of course, the inc- our incredible players. Uh, Carlos has been very vocal, Trey Hopkins, uh, Joe Boy, and uh, Gio, and that sort of whole leadership group. I know AJ Green spoke about it. Yeah, I found it fascinating um, and very, very powerful and moving, the whole thing. So hats off. Yeah, I definitely echo those echo those words. And I think the other thing that this will do, which is what well, I hope it does anyway, is to unite the locker room. Because we've said this before, there's a lot of players that have come into Cincinnati, be it free agents or through the draft. And it's a very new look team. There's a young coach, fairly new coaching staff, a lot of new players. And I think if they can sort of all rally around and unite around a certain cause or a movement or whatever you want to refer to it as, I think that's a really positive thing to sort of enhance communication and to really build up that spirit um, that you need to build a quality team. So fingers crossed that that's a a positive to come out of it. Absolutely. Um, This is going to, just to warn you, this is going to be a bit of a bumper episode, probably about an hour and a half long, because Jay's interview is is long. We've got first and 10 coming up and we've been rattling on for 20 minutes already. But um, what else is there to talk about? Uh, The Mackenzie Alexander situation is, was intriguing and kind of a heart in your mouth kind of moment for a good day or two, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, certainly when the news came out that his father had gone missing uh, down in Florida. I mean, those stories when you hear of someone sort of going missing and stuff like that, it, it, they never tend to end too positively. So it's fantastic news the next day or the day after to get the news from um, the sheriff's department or whatever they call it down in the States that, He'd presented himself and he was alive and well. So a good end to that. Obviously, Mackenzie Alexander, I think he got, was it something to do, uh, he got indicted on battery charges against the guy that apparently Mm. had left his dad or something like that. But I don't 
think I not that I know, but I don't think that there's anything that's going to come of that, be it internal discipline from the team or from the NFL. So fingers crossed for all that it ends uh, ends up being a sort of positive solution um, to to that situation. Indeed, although he did threaten the geezer with a gun, to be honest with you. So, oh, he did it. He did. So, it could, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, I and, didn't and, know that. That's uh, that's complicated a bit, doesn't it? It just slightly, slightly complicates it. Um, Joe Mixon, man, what's uh, that's the other big topic to talk about. Um, lots of words have been spoken. He's been off practice with a migraine. And uh, not to denigrate migraines, because I know that, you know, they can be uh, extremely debilitating and painful. But it just so happens he's got migraines uh, during uh, contract negotiations. Um, What's your feeling, Nathan? Is he holding out or is he, you know, it could be a bit of both, let's face it. He he could genuinely have migraines. But um, I don't know, something smells a bit fishy on the Joe Mixon front and I'm not, I'm not talking about his trousers either. <laughs> I I think that you, I mean, you can see by some of his tweets, they're very cryptic. And like you said, there's a lot of talk coming into the season. And I think even last season about him wanting to hold out. And I think that didn't someone, was it Jeff Hobson or someone said that he was planning on holding out the season before and then realized it was the wrong year of his contract. So, but, but I think what happened, and again, I might be wrong on this, but I think from what I've heard, due to all the collective bargaining agreements now, you, you're, the, the status of like, or the power you've got to sit out has been massively diminished now for some reason. And I think basically you can't just do sort of, it's not worth doing um, what we've seen in the past from some running backs and other position groups where you basically say, look, I'm not playing until we get contracts sorted. And I don't know if this sort of migraine situation we're mixing is a potential way out of that or a way, you know, because it's not a visible injury. You can't, it's quite difficult for a doctor mm, to sit there and mm. say, look, you haven't got a headache. Um, so obviously it's, yeah, I can understand the skepticism coming out of there and obviously if he gets injured or gets hurt playing running back position without a deal in place it could seriously hinder his op- um, his future earnings long term so you do sympathize with him to an extent but you wonder if a deal's close I mean there's not been too many murmurs I've heard of anyone coming out and saying that a deal is imminent um, and obviously we've got the season starting in less than two weeks I mean the one thing I feel bad for for, the, for Joe Burrow at the moment is that with Mixon sitting out at the moment they're obviously got AJ Green wrapped up in every bit of bubble wrap going that first team offense hasn't had a huge amount of time to gel together and I hope that you know they're saying they think Mixon will be available for week one but you'd like him really to be out there with um, Joe Boy sort of getting that chemistry and cohesion and learning the playbook and just learning how each other work Um, I hope that doesn't come back to haunt us um, for week one yeah I agree and still no AJ um, I mean, they know what they're doing, but they it goes against. It's a bit sort of counterintuitive, isn't it? They're kind of really wrapping these guys up in in cotton wool, and um, and and that's fine. I understand the need to do that, but as as Joe Boy came out and after last night's scrimmage, he's kind of itching to get hit. You know, he's itching yeah, to that. to feel the feel the impact of a big man slamming into him so to speak and um <laughs> and oh dear and uh haven't we all dreamt of that frankly and um uh it's it is i do wonder what it's going to be like i say i i still hold uh my uh, i'll finish the sentence i still hold my uh my theory that um Football's going to be, it's not going to be great football when it comes back because people are going to be fumbling all over the place. There's going to be fumbled handoffs. There's going to be interceptions, going to be dropped passes. And that's just because they, people haven't been hit properly, you know? Yeah, I, I also, what I really hope, I completely agree with you. I think that there is a very good chance that it could be sloppy football. But what I hope is that the NFL sits down with the referees and says, look, no one's had a preseason. <laughs> Be a bit lenient on some of the holding calls, false, you know, 
some of those calls because the last thing you want to watch in football and I think so at times in the last couple of years the NFL's been guilty of this there's just so many penalties and it's hard watching football sometimes when every other player flags are on the field it's a full star too many men downfield um, holding's always a you know a real kick in the teeth one as well and I just think that where possible like pass interferences, all of them. I just hope that the NFL in the first couple of weeks is slightly lenient to allow for the fact that there's not been a preseason. Players aren't going to be as sharp as they usually are because otherwise it could be um, a slightly tougher watch than usual. Yeah, but it's going to be like that. If it's like that, it's going to be like the Wild West out there, Nathan. People slamming, you know, <laughs> slamming into each other's helmets and um, I don't know, throwing chairs at each other and throwing people across down. Sliding them down the, bars like they're doing well in Western film. No, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, I, I just don't know what to expect, really. It's going to be a madhouse. Uh, and I'm sure the players don't. Um, still, there's two weeks to go and you hope they're going to be sharpened up um, because uh, by the sounds of it, um, last night, that you know, the, off- the defence won the day and it's great to see and hear that people like Carl Lawson and... Uh, Gino and, and Carlos and Sam Hubbard are really getting after the getting really rushing the passer and someone like an Andrew Brown who we haven't spoken about who could actually be quite crucial this season with uh the injuries on that um defensive line and also the opt outs and the uh, and all the rest of it. Andrew Brown could be quite an important player and he certainly flashed in the past, but he needs to play with greater consistency. Uh, and the offense seems to be kind of good one day, not so good the next. Um, yes, it's going to be interesting, isn't it? Yeah, and I, I, I don't think we'd ever have seen as sports fans. Certainly for me, this is how I feel. I've never been in a situation where I have no idea what to think in terms of what the Bengals are going to be like this season. I mean, it's easy to sort of be sceptical on the basis that there's been a lot of turnover and change. We weren't very good last season. But never before have I seen a sports team go straight into a season with absolutely no pre-season whatsoever with this amount of turnover. And we've got some great players that we've signed and obviously with the rookies and stuff. And I am really excited for it. But it's going to be just so... So weird yeah. on that Sunday just to be sat down, kickoff happens, and say we receive the ball and we're starting off at the 25 yard line to just see Joe Burrow out there with Mixon and Tyler Boyd, AJ Green, um, C. Joe Zama. Like, I mean, even the Bengals with the way they're wrapping people up at the moment, they've probably not even had a situation where everyone's on the field at the same time. Um, by all accounts, AJ Green should be there for the opening game. So should Joe Mixon, Tyler Boyd you know, hopefully John Ross, but they've probably never even been on the field for, you know, more than a handful of plays at once. So I understand the the narrative around wrapping everyone up. We obviously don't want to have injuries, et cetera, but you just wonder at what expense that will be for chemistry and actual performance on the field. It's a really tough balance to judge, I guess. Uh, I agree. Uh, no, I absolutely agree with that. I really do. Um, uh, well, let's find out more about training camp and uh, what happened last night. And joining us now, as promised, is our old friend Jay Morrison from The Athletic, co-presenter of uh, Hear That Podcast Growling. Jay, how are you doing? Doing great, Paul. We just uh, recorded today's episode of Hear That Podcast Growling, and Paul Daner Jr. and I did our training camp superlatives, the uh, the MVP of training camp, the, the most disappointing position, the most disappointing player, all those things. So we'll, that, that should be up later today on Monday. Well, um, as our listeners know, we're, we're big fans of, of you and Paul's and the podcast, so do go uh, and listen to that. I've um, got a question for you straight off the bat, actually, from one of our followers, if that's okay, Jay. Brian at Mapcase Exapno. I'm not going to even spell that because that would even take too much time. We absolutely must determine what is the closest thing to Arby's in the UK for the next time Jay is there. Now, if you don't know, uh, Jay's a big fan of the Arby's. Uh, what would you call it? I don't even know what Arby's is. I just kind of laugh along with the podcast because you just seem like really, really into it. And it's become a running kind of gag, hasn't it? Really? Yeah, it has. It's, it's, they, they started as a roast beef fast food place. Um, I worked there uh, at the end of my high school senior year. Um, enjoyed working there, kind of fell in love with the food and they branched out like most places have, you know, they have, they, their slogan now is we have the meats. 
So they have chicken, they have, um, they have fish. They, I mean, they, they've really expanded their menu and it's, it's what you would expect. It's fast food. It's not great stuff, but there's, I, I just, I don't know. It's one of those things. It's an acquired taste and you, you get used to it. And um, I, I visit frequently. I am, I will staunchly defend Arby's. Paul hates it, but uh, yeah, it's, it's my go-to fast food place. I was looking at the menu really to try and figure out whether there was uh, an equivalent at least of uh, uh of Arby's in the UK. I don't think there is, which is weird because roast beef is such a British thing. And, you know, so that maybe there is a gap in the market for a roast beef, beef fast food thing. But as a vegetarian, I was kind of looking at that in recoiling in horror when I was looking at the, at the menu. But, um, but you ate pretty well when you came over here last year, didn't you? Oh, I did. Yes. I, I, I still, my wife and I talk about that trip all the time, how much fun we had and how much we want to get back and, uh, yeah, I think my first meal was fish and chips, the traditional. It was that night at the tailgate at the uh, Admiralty. Yeah. And, uh, you know, from, from there, it just um, – It was we, uphill we, ever since. Oh, uh, it was great. Everywhere we went, we had it, – it was it's the service is a little different where, mm. you know, you, you sit down and they, they don't bring it to you. You have to go get no. it. It took a little while to get used to that. But my, my wife went the week before the game, so she had everything down pat. I just kind of followed her lead. And, yeah, we ate and we drank very well that week we were in London. Yeah, that's good to hear. And of course, you're welcome back anytime. And I must say, table service has changed um, since the pandemic because people with restaurants and pubs now, uh, they're trying to trying to limit social interaction. So you kind of have to stay at your table, and there is much more table service now. So mm. you'll be you'll be far more uh, used to that, I think. Listen, let's get on to football. We could talk about food and drink all day, um, as we uh, tend to do on this podcast. But um, what are the questions are you expecting me to ask you from training camp? Uh, who has looked good? <laughs> um, <laughs> which Joe Burrow, it all starts right there with him. Um, I would I would expect some questions about the offensive line and the linebackers. Those are two areas that were kind of the, the, the two biggest uh, question marks coming into the season. And then uh, beyond that, I don't know, surprise me with some questions. Well, um, I listened to the to the live scrimmage at uh, Paul Brown Stadium. Like, well, it was last night for us. It was about 11, half 11 at night. So I lay in bed listening to the dulcet tones of Dan Horde and Dave Lapham in my, my ear. Um, and that was quite a, a threesome, I must admit. But um, it, what was going on with the crowd noise? Well, first of all, what was your first... Because that must have been your first time in PBS since the, in, on the field. Or, or Where were you? Were you in a, a designated press area or were you actually on the field? Yes. Yeah, well, they, they, we were not allowed in the press box. Uh, the reason for that was they the, the Bengals um, do not have any of their media relations employees that are cleared to be in the press box. Every, there's, everything's tiered, and there's certain areas you can be and can't be. Um, so they couldn't have anybody up there to say, okay, you can't, you can't take video of this part of the scrimmage. You can't, you, now you can't take video. So they made us all sit in the seating bowl. And we were, it was, they, it was the, the <laughs> lowest section of seats and it was right on the 50 yard line. So that it was a great view. Um, and that's not what the case will be when the games start, when the games start, we will be back in the press right. box. I mean, we're, we're kind of used to watching live sport without crowds now, you know, the, the, Premiership soccer has been going on for a month. Uh, cricket, horse racing's been back. I think I'm not a huge fan of horse racing, but but so if we're kind of used to seeing the the crowdless sporting events. What was it like for you? I guess that was your first time. Um, I know you probably watched some baseball, um, but how was it as an experience? That that crowd noise sounded very weird from the, through the speakers last night. I must say. It was it was fairly annoying. At one point, I put in sponge um, sponge uh, earplugs. It was loud, and yeah, right. and the older I get, the more sensitive I get to noise. But it was difficult because you know every now and then Paul would ask me a question. We were sitting about five seats apart, and I could barely hear him without the earplugs in. With the earplugs in, I had no chance of hearing him. So I eventually took him out. Um, I assume that is the level we're going to hear at games. I, you're right. I, I've watched some baseball, listened to a lot of baseball on the radio when I'm mowing the yard or driving in the car. Um, it's, it's, it's very subtle. 
And I, I, I know a lot of people were opposed to it at first, but I think you need it. I, I think it would feel really weird and sterile without that at all. The Reds have done a great job um, with theirs because they actually have someone in the booth that adjusts the the crowd noise. And mm-hmm. so if there's a foul ball or, you know, a fly ball down the line and it could be fair, it could be foul, you kind of hear the, oh, you know, if it goes foul <laughs> or you right, hear right. the cheers if it's a home run. Yeah. And mm-hmm. they it, it, it varies depending on where it's at in the game. Um, last night it varied a little bit, but it went from like loud to screaming loud. So mm-hmm. I don't know how they're going to do this during the game. I, I don't know if every, if every team has the the same audio track that they're allowed to use. I don't know if someone's measuring decibels to make sure nobody's cranking it up too loud. Um, I don't know if it'll go completely silent when the home team's offense is on the field. There's mm-hmm. a lot of questions that are going to have to be answered. And and it will be noticeably different. When we're, when we're at the game for a live game, a regular game with a crowd, it's almost like you're in a mayonnaise jar. You're in that press box and it's really muffled. You You can't get a sense at all of how loud it really is. Right, interesting. Um, well, let's talk about events on the field. It was, um, I mean, we could talk about, you know, the the new normal in terms of practice and who's looked good in practice. Um, but fans want to know about Burrow. And he's been thrust centre stage into, um, he's not, he is the, the face of the franchise for sure. You know, we saw that last week with the, with the statement he and Trey um, gave in front of the, the Freedom Centre, which was incredible, I think. Um, again, that's a whole other conversation. But he has been thrust out there as the face of the franchise, which seems to come quite naturally to him. But just purely from a football sense, um, was, he was, it sounds like he was quite patchy last night, some good, some bad, which is to be expected, really. And what have you noticed specifically about Burrow? First of all, what has kind of had you nodding and smiling with Burrow and thinking, yeah, this guy is really good? And conversely, what has been the moments where you thought, okay, this guy needs to work on that area of his game? Yeah, I think the the thing that you you are most encouraged by is is the command and the poise and just the maturity he shows. Um, He's he's they're they're running up tempo stuff which is kind of tough to do sometimes for a rookie quarterback uh he's making checks at the line of scrimmage and calling audibles uh he he just has this this really great grasp of the offense and and um i can't remember if it was zach taylor or brian callahan the offense coordinator talked about this earlier was that they had to slow him down in the offseason when they were doing the zoom meetings and installing the offense he's asking questions you know two three weeks ahead and they're like you just we'll get to that we don't want to lose the other rookies that aren't quite as up to speed as you right now. So let's just go at this pace. And so he, he just has this, I mean, you, as you would expect as the son of a football coach, he just has this really great grasp of, of what the game is. And then specifically of what Zach Taylor wants from his offense. Um, it's, it's just, as far as that, it, the same thing kind of goes into what he does on the field when he has a, a bad play, the, the, just that that moxie and that gumption to come right back and take another shot and and put it behind him. Um, you know, the one day when he had the interception and he comes back with a deep ball down the left side and a deep ball down the right side. And it's almost kind of like, I'll show you to the defense. You know, you get me once, I'm going to get you back. And um, it's that that has been really impressive. Um, the first scrimmage that we saw, which was, I guess, 10 days ago about now, um, he just – carved up that defense it was it was as Paul said on the podcast today it was his coming out party mm. um last night was not like that uh the 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 defensive backs got their hands on a lot more balls uh the defensive line c- kind of chased him all over the place they didn't let him get comfortable in the pocket uh part of that was due to the fact that I think Lou Anarumo dialed up the defense a little bit more and sent some blitzes at Joe and and really challenged him um, and part of that was there was no – well, there was no A.J. Green in the first scrimmage. But, mm-hmm. I mean, last night it was no A.J. Green, no John Ross, um, no Auden Tate. There was – it was – Auden Tate is the one that has – that Joe has really just established this great relationship with. Him and Tyler Boyd clicked right off the bat. And then it, the, the, once he felt comfortable with that, then he moved on and Auden Tate was his guy. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I think not having Auden in there last night, which we – we don't know why, um, mm. uh, but 
not having him, I just think it was more of a, a stilted performance. He started 0 for 3. One of those was a drop. Then he comes back and goes 9 of 10 on his next 10 passes, um, but uh, only had the one touchdown pass, whereas in the in the scrimmage, he had multiple – the first scrimmage, he had multiple touchdown passes. So it's just part of the learning process for a young quarterback. And um, I, I just <clears> – <throat> I think it's interesting that – the, 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 you mentioned the Freedom Center, the fact that he, he Joe talked last night after the scrimmage about how his teammates wanted him to do that. And, you know, to, to put a rookie in that position, um, it, it just – he was really touched by it. And it said it, it made him really feel at home. And not that he felt like an outcast before, but as a rookie, you're always kind of – unsure of your standing even if you're a number one overall pick and a guy like Joe Burrow and and that really you know like he said made him feel at home and it's just you look at a two and 14 team that turns things over to a rookie quarterback and it's almost like okay this season's going to be basically like one big preseason and then next year's the year that we're really going to go and this Mm -hmm. doesn't have that feeling it feels like this team is is firmly behind Joe Burrow has all the confidence in the world that, that this can be a competitive team that can challenge for a playoff spot. Now, whether they will or not, who knows, but, but believing that is a big first step. Well, I was going to ask you, I mean, the, the team feels completely together. And if one good thing comes out of this kind of, you know, the, the black lives matter situation with, with so much going on with that, on the streets and, and in pro sports and throughout society, they do, it does feel that it's kind of brought them together. Yeah. Not just the players. Um, I, I mentioned this on the podcast today. It was, it, it, it felt like it was a bonding for the entire organization to have Mike Brown, the owner there to have members of the coaching staff in the front office. And it wasn't a, Hey, let's check this box and kind of appease the players. They've been asking for this. It, it really felt, I wasn't there in person. Um, make that clear. It wasn't open to the media, but just talking to, to the people that were there and seeing the videos and just the, the, the pride that um, all the Bengals players expressed on social media when that was over and talking about unity. And uh, I think that was a huge step. It, it's not like this was a fractured organization by any means, but you, you request a, a meeting with the owner and you get it the next day. Mm-hmm. And then the day after that, he's, he's with you walking arm in arm essentially to, to an event like that at the underground railroad freedom center. It's just, it, it felt like a, a really, uh, powerful moment for this this organization going forward. Um, absolutely, and I, I actually take my hat off to Mike um, for doing that. I thought it was a brilliant gesture, and not just a box ticking exercise because he just doesn't do that kind of thing, does he? Really. Um, no. Going back to football, and you mentioned a group that fascinates me earlier: the defensive backs and the secondary. Even though you know they made some moves in the off season, they've kind of lost Trey Waynes pretty much for the whole season. Let's face it, he could be back at the end of November, December. Um, obviously, Mackenzie Alexander has been through a, a hellish situation down. Where was it, Florida or was it up in? It was uh, in Florida, yes. It was, yeah. Um, so there's been disruption there. And the question is, can Darius Phillips make that step up? Can someone like Tony Brown uh, or Winston Rose uh, do something? Can William Jackson play up to his potential? They see, you know, like everywhere on that Bengals team, there's a lot of ifs and buts there. Um, and you said uh, last night they they were kind of getting to the ball a little bit better. Was there, Are you seeing improvement uh, in the secondary? Um, yeah, marginally. It's not been great. Now, Will Jackson has really been one of the the bright spots of camp. He is he he looks closer to his 2017 self than he did to last year. Mm. Um, but you know, you mentioned Darius Phillips. He he sat out the last practice with what Zach said was a lower leg injury. He did not take part last night. There was there was a lot of players, potential starters, that were not in that scrimmage last night. Um, we don't know how serious. Darius Phillips injury is Um, Zach called it minor. I think it's just precautionary not to put him in a position in a scrimmage to injure it further. But um, Tony Brown uh, jumped in front of two Ryan Finley passes. Both should have been interceptions and he dropped them, but they, you know, he got his hands on it. He broke the pass up. Uh, Winston Rose still has been a bit of a disappointment. I I think a lot of people were excited to see what he could do after how brilliant he was in the, in the CFL. And it just hasn't translated 
uh, LaShawn Sims, who they signed in the off season from Tennessee. Um, he's, he's had good moments and he's had bad moments. So it's, it, it, one of the superlatives we had on the podcast was most di- disappointing position. And I think Paul and I were both in agreement. It would be cornerbacks if we didn't, if we weren't talking about Trey Waynes being out and McKenzie Alexander being out and Darius Phillips being out That's three of your top four. So yeah, that group is going to struggle. But uh, last night was, was a positive sign. And a lot of it was because Joe was forced to rush his throws uh, because mm-hmm. of the, the pass rush was getting there. But um, that that is a pretty big concern right now, where that where that uh, cornerback room stands. Okay, let's go there. I'm going to be that predictable. You mentioned that the pass rush was getting to Joe much more last night. Um, we've been hearing good things about Jonah, which is great news. Um, hopefully, he'll have that kind of left hand side tied down. Uh, what about the the rest of the offensive line? It, I mean. They did improve towards the end of last year, like the whole team did. Um, a lot of fans out there are still desperate for Fred Jackson to to unseat Bobby Hart. Um, they're a little bit worried about uh, Xavier Surfilo. We know that Trey is going to be solid. Uh, we know that Michael Jordan, by the looks of things, has uh, made some physical transformation this offseason and looks better uh, are you seeing improvement from that group at all? Yes, but it's still hard to tell when it's not actual full speed tackling. Uh, uh, you know, uh, all a defensive player has to do is basically get a, a touch on a running back, and so it's it's kind of hard to judge how big the holes are that they're opening up. And um, the pass rush is one thing that is you know full speed basically, and it it as good as Sam Hubbard and, and Carlos Dunlap was before his injury and Carl Lawson is always incredible in training camp and he's out right now with an injury. Um, most of those pressures have either come up the middle mm. from, from Gino um, or Andrew Brown and even DJ reader has shown to get a nice push or off of that left side of the defense, right side of the offensive line. Um, against Bobby Hart and it's when we went for most disappointing player of camp I voted for Fred Johnson because I thought this was really going to be an open competition at right tackle and uh, it it has not gone that way Uh, Bobby Hart missed one practice and we saw Fred Johnson get some first team reps that day Um, but he's he struggled against second teamers and um, it's I, I don't I don't know how much of it is he wasn't given a fair shake to begin with or how much of it was maybe he struggled with stuff, picking stuff up in the off season, but they, they went into camp with Bobby Hart firmly entrenched as their starter and Fred's done nothing to suggest that's going to change by the time the regular season starts. That's a real disappointment, isn't it? Um, okay. Let's wrap this up. You've been great with your time as ever, Jay, and we do enjoy talking to you. A couple of questions to wrap this up. Um, is it Jacques Patrick or Jacques Patrick, as Dan Horde was calling him last night? We've been calling him Jacques because it sounds lovely in French. But um, well, how are you? How are you pronouncing his name? It's Jacques. Um, I actually ah. I sp- I spoke with him last week. I'll have a story coming out tomorrow Wednesday on him. He's really he's got a really interesting path to the NFL. Oh. And I, when I talked to him, I called him Jacques. I thought that's right. how he said his name. Yeah, uh, right. and, and then it wasn't until um, I talked to his position coach, uh, Jamal Singleton, he called him Jacquez. And then I talked to Mark Trestman, who was his coach in the XFL, and he called him Jacquez. So I sent him a text and apologized for mispronouncing his name. And he's, he's a great young man. He didn't, he didn't seem to mind. But uh, officially, it is Jacquez. Okay. Well, we've been told. Um but that the back end of that running back room is kind of interesting with uh, Perrine and 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 Patrick there, and you've I mean someone mentioned today that uh, Patrick is Derek Henry's size or thereabouts. You know he's a big lad. Um, do you think he's got a shot of making the team? Um, I don't know. A lot of that's going to depend on the ripple effect with Joe Mixon and where things go mm. with his contract negotiation. But uh, Travion Williams is in that mix too. You know, he was a, a draft pick last year, six round, never got a single snap on offense. Um, they 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 went light. I think they, the 
they had three running backs on the 53 at most times last year. And if they go that direction again, it's, it's Joe Mixon, it's Giovanni Bernard, and then it's one of those other spots. Um, Jacquez is, he's Derrick Henry's size height wise. He's not quite as big and thick as Derrick Henry, right, but okay. he, he runs like him. He, he runs people over that first scrimmage. They did some live tackling drills and he was plowing people over. He really kind of lit up the team. Everybody was excited to see that. Um, he did have a couple good runs last night and he got some snaps with the first team. Um, I, I don't know if, if he's going to make the 53, but they, they've expanded the practice squad, 16 guys. Um, I, I'm not sure, you know, if, if they do cut him and then try to bring him back on the practice squad, he would have to clear waivers. Uh, it'd be interesting to see if if anybody does claim him. He was the second leading rusher on his XFL team, but he was the number three rusher in the entire XFL league. Mm-hmm. So he, he, he is – he's coming into his own as a player and he doesn't have the wear and tear that a lot of running backs have because he barely played his first two years at Florida state. He was behind Dalvin mm-hmm. cook. Who's the, the pro bowl running back for the Vikings. And then there was another really good running back that he kind of split time with his second two years there. So he's still got a lot of tread on the tires. He that one of the reasons I'm doing the story on him is because he is such an, such an interesting mm. uh, prospect uh, with making the, the team and his his path to get to the NFL has been so unique. And I think fans love those kind of back of the roster guys who flash, you know, we all love seeing underdogs make the team. Um, and I think uh, Jacquez is, uh, is the man this year. He's, he's really interesting. And of course, Marcus Bailey, we had him on the podcast. And I think all British fans are rooting for Marcus Bailey and, and, he seems to have a shot to make that team. Are there any other guys at the back end of the roster that have impressed you or, you know, how, do you think have a real shot of making uh, the final 53? It's funny you mentioned Marcus because I've the, – from draft – the night they drafted him, I said that could be the steal of the draft. I mean, he's a guy that's a second – he could have been a, a Friday draft pick if he didn't have the, the knee injuries and he – it's like, okay, well, he's going to be behind because all these other guys are going to get work in OTAs, and then OTAs get canceled, and basically he's yeah. starting from from an even starting line with the other linebackers, and he has been healthy since the start of camp. He's he's looked really good, but most of his reps have been against the second and third team. Uh, the last practice we saw, he was running with the first team, and, and he was in there. They were really jumbling everybody up linebacker-wise last night, but he got – a number of snaps with the first team and he just he just has this presence about him when he's on the field uh he he has the command uh kind of like Joe Burrow of that defensive huddle there was one point when he went up and kind of patted Mike Daniels a a 10-year veteran on the hip and moved him over because he wasn't lined up right it just that's it's pretty impressive for a rookie to be in that position and um he I do I think all three of those linebackers that they draft and Logan Wilson in the third round, Akeem Davis Geither in the fourth round and, and Marcus Bailey in the seventh. I think all three of those guys are going to end up on the 53. Um, as far as other guys, um, Stanley Morgan's one to watch. He had an incredible one handed catch last night, not, not just a one handed catch, but he got both feet down uh, on a sideline route. Uh, he's really good on special teams. We know where they are on, on with how the injuries at wide receiver, um, Maybe they go heavy there and go with eight instead of seven. I don't know if they would do that, but um, Alex Erickson was a guy that before camp started we thought might be a cat, might be a cut casualty. Um, but with Darius Phillips pressed into a bigger role on as a cornerback, and with Alex Erickson just making plays every single time he's given an opportunity, um, I think he's a lock for the roster at this point. Mm-hmm. So, so th- those are some of those the 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 key battles for those final few spots that we'll be keeping an eye on. Well, uh, we've only got two weeks, which is astonishing to think, really, after everything that's happened. Um, Well, it's under two weeks now, isn't it? So um, we will be watching out for all those little battles. And uh, when is the final 53 announced, Jay? uh, Saturday by 4 p.m. Eastern, they have to have it done. Normally, they start letting the players know a little bit early in the day and and we'll be we'll be in touch with all the players and their agents and trying to get the news out before the, the team makes it official. But uh, it, the official announcement has to be by four o'clock Saturday. So you heard that uh, here first folks um, do follow Jay at Jay Morrison 
Ath, A-T-H. Uh, go and read him at the, on The Athletic. It's a brilliant uh, service, affordable, value for money because you can go and get all your kind of football news and lots of other different sports. But for me personally, Paul and Jay are my go-to guys for Bengals News and Bengals Insights. So go and um, subscribe if you can. Jay, it's always a pleasure to catch up with you. Um, good luck with the season. We'll be cheering you on and the team on and uh, stay safe over there. All right. Thank you, Paul. Always great to talk to you. There we go. That was uh, our old friend Jay Morrison. A big thanks to him. Always a treat to talk with Jay. And as ever, he came up with some really interesting things. Um, not least that uh, the correct way to pronounce a Jacques Patrick is not a Jacques Patrick. It is Jacques Patrick which is slightly disappointing, really. I came up with another French name uh, the other day. Do you want to hear it? Go on. Paris Campbell. <laughs> <laughs> Plays there you go. The second the, year The uh, Bengals UK French 11 is um, He's taking out by the week. shape. And there's another one, actually, that Matt Moon came up with. Let me just uh, see if I can find it. Um, Tyron Mathieu. Mathieu. Yeah, oh, yeah, that's good chat. Je m'appelle Taron Mathieu. There was obviously, do you remember uh, the old running back, Pierre Thomas? Yes, anybody with Pierre Garçon oh, is obviously a very French name. Uh, Pierre Thomas, that's right. Jason Pierre Paul. Uh, that's all the Pierres I can think of, really. So it's coming together. I think it's quite a team. Anyway, um... Yeah, uh, it's interesting. I I tend to kind of, I've been getting excited and my expectation levels have been rising. But then you hear someone like Jay, who's such a balanced and f a fine journalist and reporter, and it kind of just levers you off a bit, you know, just hearing about the defensive backs who haven't been great um, this off-season. We're obviously hoping for McKenzie to come back and add some more depth and solidity. Darius Phillips didn't play yesterday because of his... Uh, uh, a lower leg injury, I think it was. So that's actually the one position group that's kind of worrying me a little bit at the moment, I must say. Yeah, I mean, it requires William Jackson to have a big year. Obviously, it's been a massive hindrance to us having Trey Waynes go down. Um, I think he was really a pivotal free agent to sort of solidify that group. Yeah. Um we're just going to have to wait and see. I mean, if they're not looking good against the, you know, the seconds at the moment, because I've really, the, they've not been tested with players like AJ Green. Ross has been really limited. So mm -hmm. if players like Alden Tate, no disrespect to Alden Tate, but if he's having, you know, career days against them, going up and catching everything, um, when they're going up against Keenan Allen in week one, that's going to be slightly, slightly scary proposition. Yes. Um, right, let's get to our question. Next week, we do have our bumper preview episode season preview episode uh so look out for that next monday four hours long that's gonna be it's gonna be four hours four hours of solid podcast gold and no guests just no guests two just... hours each of us like two hours of you and two hours of me <laughs> i could not think of anything worse to be honest with you um but no do uh stick around for that and there'll be something else on the sunday night which we'll talk about on our social channels uh let's start with our correspondence again you can get hold of us at uh who day underscore uk on twitter and bengals uk on facebook uh rosie at rosie underscore may 16 what's your confidence levels for this season and how well do you think the first game will go i think we have the potential for a good winning season if the starters stay healthy it kind of plugs into what we've been talking about um uh rosie to be honest with you um I think, um, as I say, I kind of flip-flop from like a big flippity-floppity thing from being excited and thinking, do you know what? If, if, if everything clicks, you know, we could be yellow, you know, a bit, a bit, oi, saucy. Oi. Oi, oi, a bit saucy this season. But then it's like, oh, come on, there's just too many ifs and buts. Well, you know, what if the offensive line isn't very good? What if the linebackers with all these new guys don't click straight away? What if the defensive backs aren't very... What if Burrow is just OK? You know, um, so I do think there's a lot of ifs and buts there. 
but I'm moderately confident. I, I tell you what I am, because I do think this team could be a really good team, but with time, and let's face it, you know, the off-season and the pre-season hasn't been the best in terms of, as we've been talking about, practising and yada, yada, yada. I do think this there's the potential there for a, a really quite a decent team. Uh, but have they had enough time to gel and work together? I don't know, man. I don't know. And then it's the, hard, isn't it? It really it's hard. hard. Yeah, it is hard. I mean, for me, that first game to answer Rosie's question there is so important. I think last year against Seattle, we came out and we looked fantastic, and you had all this hype about Zach Taylor all off season and about how he was coming up with these fantastically innovative plays and. We looked really good against Seattle. There was some really creative for like John Ross had a huge game. There was some flea flickers. It was very exciting. You know, we should have won that game. And you think, God, if we'd won that game, what could that have done for us last season? It might have just given some more belief. It gives you a bit more um, cohesion and chemistry. And I think we could have, you know, certainly won more than we did last year if we'd managed to win that game. But I think this season is the same. I just think if we get spanked first game of the season by the Chargers and we look really poor and we look all, you know, well out of sorts and it doesn't come together, I think that's going to be, for all the fans and all the excitement, I know we've got Burrow and he's going to be here for a long time and that's an exciting proposition, but I think if it's a big, big game, especially with no pre-season and not really knowing what we're getting with this team, I think we've got to win it. The Chargers aren't a good team. They're, they're not going to be... The Chargers... I would be shocked if they were in around the playoffs or any further. So we're at home. It's going to be one of our best chances of getting a win. And I think it's, I mean, like you, it's hard to judge, but I think this is a game we've got to win. Um, so I'm going to be edge of my seat for that one. Cause if we could go out one and oh, I just think the amount of belief, I mean, you, you've got to remember for this team for the last, the whole of last season and the half of the season before that, we've not even been competitive. I mean, I remember watching a lot of those games just being like, oh, this is awful here. Not even knowing, you know, half the fans didn't even want us to win. So I'm actually looking forward to seeing a game that is competitive and everyone in cohesion wants us to win. <laughs> you know, so big game, I think. Really, really big game. Uh, Jamie at Trick Quiet Beast here. Bengals UK now have a YouTube channel. Uh, did we mention that? I think we did, didn't we? Uh, what BBFC rating are you going to give the output? 15, 18 even? Um, that's, uh, I, can't, I don't know what that equates to in American uh, certification, but it's basically adult material or kind of parental guidance material. I know, I think I've been hearing whispers that Nathan's going to do live strip shows on... Uh, on YouTube, is that right, Nathan? Did that, is that right? No, I, I, yeah, all to be confirmed. <laughs> but I would, I would say, I say our channel's a solid fifteen. It's not. There's nothing worse. You, a film is never what, worth watching if it's a twelve. Never. Like twelve A, you just don't watch it. Fifteen is always like right, cool, you know, decent. I don't think we're eighteen level content yet. You know, there's not going to be any explicit nudity. I don't think there's going to be like, any particular <laughs> like hard drug references or right, right. you know any sort of like real like extreme violence. But there might be sort of some mild sexual of, content, basically. Well, absolutely, and some yeah. mild violence and re drug references, and you know, but I think fifteen would be a healthy sort of rating for the YouTube channel, I would say. All right. Well, don't listen to him. Uh, I mean, would listeners. you want 14-year-olds what like, like tuning in? I don't know if I... You know what I mean? There'd be some... Well, God knows what's going on on there. Like, you've got... The, for the... You, for the... You've got, you Memphis, you got Memphis... You've got uh, Memphis Soul Stew. You never know what he's capable of. You know, there's a few <laughs> geezers that you just... You can't predict what they're going to do. Like, it's got to be 15. True. Uh, parental guidance is uh, needed, I think. Um, but seriously, yeah, I mean, we're all about growing the community over there. And this is the reason why we're doing it. So tell your friends. Just not for anyone under 15. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. Uh, as long as your mum and dad are there, that's fine. Uh, speaking of Memphis Soul Stew, here he is at Stuart Baird 688. Do you have any pre season rituals or habits? This is a great question, actually. Um, do you have any pre-season rituals or habits for years now? I have watched any given Sunday. It gets me right in the mood for football. Um, well, for me, over the past several years, it's all about making sure we know what we're doing for Bengals UK, really. And uh, I think with the uptick in in kind of 
because you know we normally have breaks during the summer don't we for for this podcast but not so this year but um so we've been at it all through bloody summer really uh which has been fine and, and great fun but um um yeah so uh my ritual no i don't really have a ritual i think i i kind of know when it's happening when i start my fantasy leagues so i've started that and uh obviously just planning the year ahead or at least the season's activities for bengals uk i mean i don't rub myself down with with linseed oil or liniment or anything like that and uh unlike you Stuart, no doubt in your pants with that uh with that uh uh <laughs> that carpet but um yeah it's a great question but that's my long answer what about you nathan do you do anything to i always get some friends around on a sunday fairly early before the game maybe three or four o'clock have a few beers i always do a massive 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 tray of nachos massive you know really get some good cheeses in that's some monterey jack and you know it melts quite well and you get all these different chilies and some really good salsa sauces a bit of sour cream on there absolutely there will be you know, some really good chilies as well just like really really like good good nachos um possibly get pizza in or we sometimes do um some wings which are really really good um in buffalo sauce or barbecue sauce so it's always just a good excuse to get everyone together have some drinks when well, as soon as those nachos are out in front of you and you've got beer in your hands and you're watching the sort of preview show i think that's that just sort of really hits home that it's back and you've got three months worth of or three and a half months worth of quality content on a sunday because i'm not being funny sundays are a bit dull aren't they when when you've not got the nfl they are a bit dull, and I think when the NFL's on, it just completely transforms your entire weekend. Um, I so agree. I can't wait. No, neither can I. Um, we've got some more questions coming up, but let's uh, let's let's go and play first and ten. And now we welcome in Duncan Price from Brighton. Uh, you may know him from previous podcasts as at Dastardly Duncan. So we're about to find out how Dastardly Duncan really is. Uh, Duncan, welcome. Hello, how are you doing? Hi, Paul. I'm very pleased to be on. It's a, it's a, it's a dream come true for me. <laughs> Long time listener, first time caller, you know. Exactly. So, <laughs> are you ready to play first and ten? I think so. Well, you know the rules. Uh, you start off at your own 20. You have 12 questions to move 80 yards. Uh, with each question, you're confronted with a choice. You can go for an easy question, which is a five-yard gain, a moderately difficult question, uh, which is a 10-yard gain. And if you want to go for the long, arcing pass down the sideline to AJ Green at any time for a touchdown, for a walk-off touchdown, you can do. Uh, so, um, Duncan, you, you've kind of logged into Zoom as D money, which suggests to me that you're quite confident, are you? Um, well, quietly confident, let's say that. But we'll find out when you start asking the question. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah, <laughs> exactly. And um, uh, have you got much quizzing background? Uh, what made you kind of put your hand up for this? A bit of an amateur pub quizzer of uh, of latter days. Um, okay. But uh, I just know random things. So I probably, I, I might get a really hard one, but miss an easy one. Or I don't know. That's, yeah, exactly. In a way, that's what I'm hoping. Well, um, you'll probably beat Nathan. You'll probably beat Jimmy because they kind of floundered at their own 30. No, at the, I think Nathan got to the 30-yard line and floundered. And uh, Jimmy got to his own 40-yard line and uh came up short but you've got to meet beat marissa contepelli's nine question touchdown drive so let's do it what are you going for first it's a first and ten for your own 20 what are you going for first duncan i think i'll take an easy just to okay. you know move the sticks what number jersey does t higgins wear 85 correct thank god <laughs> Second and five, what are you going to go for? I will take another uh, easy, please, Paul. Okay. Question number two from your own 25. 
Who is Jay Z married to? Beyonce. Correct, and a first down. Okay. What are you going to go for next? I think I'll be ambitious and go for a medium. Okay, okie dokie. So, this is first and ten from your own 30. Question three. What style of music did Taylor Swift start in? That would be country. Correct. Yeah. You're answering these uh, quite quickly, easily. <laughs> I can see you selecting a hard one there, Paul. <laughs> no, no, I'm not. I have to write all this down in case I bugger this up. Uh, okay, so you're at your own 40-yard line now. Nice little drive developing now. Nice mixture between path and rush. What are you going to go for next on your next first down for question four? I think in order to beat Marissa, I'm going to have to go for another medium, I think. Okay. What happens if you put a rotten egg in water? Uh, mm, tricky one. I th- this has only happened to me once. I have a vague recollection it sort of went green. <laughs> Is that <laughs> That's your... all I can come up with. That's my answer, yeah. I'm afraid not. It floats. It's the test yeah. to find out whether your eggs are still edible past your sell by day. If you My put an egg in a, wasn't in a glass of water and it sinks to the bottom, you're good to go. But if it floats, do not touch it. Or else poopoo time. <laughs> um, I'll remember that forever more now. <laughs> second and ten, question five, and you're still on your 40. Second and ten. I think I'll take an easy one. Oh, no, bear with. See if we can get another first down. What is the capital of Iceland? Reykjavik. Correct. Crucial. Third and five from the 45. What are you going to get? Well, we'll take another easy one. Okay. Let's get that first down. Uh, sorry, this is question six now. Uh, who has been the longest serving monarch of the UK? Mm. I'll put this in the easy one because, well, anyway. <sighs> That's tricky. It's between two. Yeah. <laughs> I'll say. I'm gonna whatever it is. I'm gonna go for the wrong one. I'll say Queen Victoria. No, it is Queen. It's this one. Second. Yeah. Okay. okay. So you're fourth and five at the forty-five, Duncan. You can go for an easy one. It's question seven. You've got questions in the bank. I think I'll have to go for an easy one. Yeah, and then we might be in hail mary territory. <laughs> <laughs> Oktoberfest in Germany is celebrated with which drink? Traditionally celebrated with which drink? Uh, is beer a. It is, and it's correct. <laughs> so you move to the 50, and it's first and 10 at midfield. This is your eighth question. Oh, well, I have to go for a Hail Mary just to see if I can beat Marissa at this point, I think. Okay. So we'll go okay. for a hard one. Yes, okay, we'll go for a hard one. Usain Bolt set the world record for the 100 metres with a time of 9.58 seconds. What year did he break the record? Oh dear. Um, hmm. Probably just going to pick a random one. Let's go 2007. Only two years out, 2009. Oh. Oh, So it's second and 10. This is question nine. And we get this 12 questions, isn't it? Indeed, yeah. Let's have another hard one then, Paul. This would tie Marissa if you got this one. Yeah. Who invented the little black dress? Uh, Coco Chanel. You got it! It is a touchdown! It's a He's done it. throw from Joe Burrow all the way down the sideline to AJ Green. He romps home. He's got it. He ties Marissa for the walk-off touchdown. Nine Uh. questions. D-Money lives up to his name. A great answer there, my friend. Well done. Thank you very much, Paul. So I got more excited than you did there. Um, (laughs) Well, I wanted to win, you know. Exactly. Okay, You are dastardly. You are dastardly, Duncan. No one messes with the DD. The double D. Well, uh, thank you for that, Duncan. Are you looking forward to uh, the season? We're um, re- what are we recording this on a Sunday afternoon. It's only two weeks away. It's pretty crazy, isn't it? Yeah, it doesn't seem real. I think because of the no uh, preseason games, um, it kind of 
even though there's a lot of news coming out and there's obviously scrimmages and stuff, um, it just uh, it doesn't feel like it's still quite kicked into to high gear. But obviously, that will start in, in two weeks. So, mm, mm. yeah. Are you fully excited <laughs> about the whole Borrow situation? Are you, are you fully on board now, engaged and ready to go? Oh, definitely. Yeah, I am. Um, not been a massive follower of like college football before um but i watched some games uh, at the end of last season obviously i had a feeling we were going to take burrow um and he just absolutely blew me away um with with what he could do and his improvisation skills and his decision making um and once i i saw those games uh, especially the one against i think it was clemson um it was uh, he had to go number one to us for my money and um, I think it gives us a sense of optimism for the season um, it's something new something to get excited mm-hmm. about and uh, to be honest with you with this season I, I kind of see it as a bit of a wash if, if we do well then obviously all the better um, but with everything that's going on in the world at the moment um, you know even if we just see, uh, see it as a, a stepping stone to the following season um, and that's where we really make some progress then, uh, then that'll do me to be honest with you Good stuff, mate. Well, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you for playing first and ten. You uh, you are atop the leaderboard in the clubhouse with Marissa uh, having scored a touchdown once again from uh, identically to Marissa. Uh, nine questions from the 50-yard line. So congratulations, uh, Duncan, and we'll speak to you soon. Thank you, Paul. So there we go. Duncan scores a touchdown and he is uh, tied with Marissa Contepelli, a 50-yard touchdown pass after on his ninth question. So he is atop the leaderboard. That was quite an exciting instalment, Nathan, I think. Yeah, very well. I mean, look, just want to make sure that you're protecting the end zone as you should be, my son. You know, <laughs> just you keep these keep these questions nice and fiendish for the guests. Oh, they were quite, I think they were quite fiendish this week, don't you? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. Good. Okay, let's go. Well done, Duncan. Um, we we will have another episode of First and Ten next week. Um, uh, let's get back to the questions. Uh, Ken Davis at Ken Davies. Will there be any surprises when the final roster of 53 is announced? Who is going to be undeservedly cut and who is going to be undeservedly retained? Alternatively, if you had, had the power to cut a player who won't be cut, who would it be? I think we all know who that player would be, Ken, don't you? Um, I, you know, we don't need to mention his name at all. Um, uh, it's an interesting one. As Jay alluded to, there are a couple of guys on the back end of the roster who are making some really strong arguments for for being kept on. Alex Erickson is having a really good camp, and I thought he was for the chop. Stanley Morgan made an amazing catch uh, during scrimmage yesterday, by all accounts. And you can't dis- discount the fact that he had a terrific season, terrific rookie season on special teams last year. He was one of our best special teams players. So do you keep him for that value? Um, what about the linebacker room? Do you? I know he's he's injured at the moment, um, but do you keep Jordan Evans or you know these sort of guys? Uh, how many running backs do you keep? How many wide receivers do you keep? Do you trade Billy Price or not? Um, I don't know. There's a few lingering questions, I think. Um, For the most part, I think it's pretty set, don't you? I think it's going to be interesting to see if they take three quarterbacks. I I personally think they'll cut Dollar Gala. I've not heard enough in this. I mean, it's hard, again, being the third quarterback to really get the chance or the fourth quarterback in this instance. But I don't think he's going to be kept on. Um... I think Ryan Finley, by all accounts, I mean, he, he's looked quite good. I know he that everyone was sort of so down on him last year, which I thought was really harsh, to be honest. I'm not saying he's by any means a star or he's going to be like the world on fire, but we were a really bad team last year with very poor weapons and a poor offensive line. And I think to throw a third round um, or fourth round, I can't remember the round, but the, to throw him in as a rookie into that um, situation, I thought was pretty unkind. So... I'm glad to see that he seems to have had a fairly decent camp, and I'm sure he'll retain the job as the backup, which is which is good. Um, it's always difficult with the surprises. I think more than ever because we haven't actually been able to see anyone um, in live action, so it's it's difficult to say. But oh, you never rule it out. Um, like you said, Billy Price potential, you know, potential there to be traded. 
Um, we should have to see. You never know. Do you, I mean, what might happen, I suppose, for the Bengals, if they if there is a position of need like cornerback or something like that, they may well look around the league you know, once it's all been announced, if there's a really solid player that they quite like and they're quite high on that gets cut from elsewhere, they may then have to sort of make a move slightly later down the line to be able to accommodate that player. So that's always, I think, you know, there's always a potential chance of that. Uh, speaking of which, Dom at Bumbling Bengal. Hey guys, hope you're doing well. Do you think we should claim Fournette on the waiver wire? Surely it can't hurt, right? Cheers, guys. Uh, I think it might hurt. I think it might destay. He's not the greatest character by all accounts he's a good player um but he's been quite disruptive in jacksonville hasn't he and also i don't know whether he's going to fit into zach's culture and also finances why obviously it all depends on what happens with mixon but uh, i don't know i wouldn't actually no i wouldn't either he, by all accounts that it's not had been the, the most rave reviews around his character and i mean Whatever happens with Mixon, I think there's no way the Bengals are going to bring in a guy that's going to rival Mixon like that. They've already paid Giovanni Bernard a lot of money by all accounts. I just don't think there's room for him. Um, I don't think there's a need. I think Mixon will play this season, uh, whether he's under a new contract or not. Um, and it's his job. I just don't think we need to overcomplicate the situation there. Agreed. TJ Hushmanzada's shiny shoes at TJ's shiny shoes... No, again, you don't give him a solid handle, but I'm going to give him a solid handle. Spit and he asks, which Bengal on the 90-man roster has the solidest handle? Ooh, Jack Patrick has got to be up there. Jacquez, Nathan. Jacquez. Jacquez Patrick. Oh, yeah. Is that not just about the American pronunciation? Uh, I don't know. Well, it's his pronunciation. As Jay, as Jay said, you know, he consulted his position coach. He consulted his XFL coach, and they both said it was, it was Jacquez, and he apologised to Jacquez for pronouncing it Jacques, and he said, no worries, man. So it is Jacquez, unfortunately. Nah, I don't know. That's if it was Jacquez, I'd probably <laughs> give it. Um, <laughs> he'd probably be up there. I mean, there's a lot of good names on the Bengals, though, isn't there? I mean, Carlos Dunlap's quite a good name. Yeah, yeah. Um, See, I like Hakeem Adenji. Hakeem Adenji is a great name. Yeah, yeah, I like him. Uh, I also like O'Shea Dugas. Uh, yeah, because he just again, he just sounds like some dude from a nineteen uh, seventies gangster movie. Do you know what I mean? Um, yeah, yeah. So I'm going for O'Shea Dugas. I think or Dugas. Oh, I don't know. Um, yeah. I think that's it. AJ Green's a solid animal for a wide receiver. It's just a pretty sort of cool name in it. AJ yeah. Green. Yeah, no, like, I that's agree. A solid. There's a, there's a few good solid handles out there, like yeah. uh, CJ Uzama. That's a bit of a mad name, isn't it? I mean, there's so many <laughs> Americans known for mad names. They like, are. There's so many crazy names knocking about in the states. Like it's far more exciting than you get in the UK. The UK is so. Quite dull names, aren't we? They're all quite sort of standard names. Yeah. Whereas in the US, you get some fantastic. Fantastic names. Absolutely. C come on, UK. Up your name game. That's what we're saying. We just need to start like calling people some mad names, like you know, real, real characterful names. We just not. We're not got enough of them over here. Yeah, like okay. Paul Hirons and Nathan Palmer. Nothing wrong with either of them. Yeah. But it's just not got the, the. There's nothing exciting there, is it? No. 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 I agree. Like Jamie Rowe, Peter Dadsworth. They're all just bang standard British names, aren't they? We yes. need. We need some exciting, <laughs> solid handles out there. Uh, I like the way you picked on Jamie and Pete there, but there we go. Um, well, Michael Smith, Simon Hunter, they're all boring names. They? No, no, we ain't got any O'Shea Dugas, have we? We haven't. You're just Sam, you... Sam Angel, it's a boring name. We need some good names. We just take. You're just taking down the entire Bengals UK fan base here, aren't you? Have we got any fan that's got? I mean, Stuart Baird is a, a very normal name. You got. <laughs> You know, J Jimmy, Jim Bingham, that's a very a bog standard name as well. We ain't got any exciting names. Amy Smith, you know, it's all, we've got nothing. Look at the Bengals. O'Shea Dugas and Dunlap, AJ Green, TJ Hushmanzada. I mean, it's madness, isn't it? Oh, dearie me. See, you wait an hour and a half and then suddenly Nathan explodes at the end of the podcast into some... <laughs> Uh, takedown of our, our entire fan base. So if you're still listening, uh, thanks very much and 
Uh, we'll, we'll probably if you've got an exciting you name, let us know. All right, okay. Well, there we go. That's your lot for this week. Um, thank you again for listening. Again, stay tuned to our social channels for news of our you new YouTube channel, and if you haven't, go on the YouTube and search for Bengals UK and give us a subscribe. Uh, as I say, plenty of video content coming up during the season, starting from this Sunday. Next Monday, uh, we'll be back with the podcast with our bumper uh, season preview episode. A huge thanks to Jay Morrison uh, for joining us. Uh, congratulations to Duncan uh, Price. Dastardly Duncan, who um, who was victorious in first and ten. Uh, so until next week, it's a who day from me. And a who day from me. Cheers, guys. And it should also be noted that the views and opinions expressed within this podcast do not reflect those of the Cincinnati Bengals organisation.